welcome back to the Bible Feed podcast. Um, we're here continuing our series, which I think will be four episodes in total. And this is the second in a series looking at all of the topics around the devil, Satan, demons, and related topics to that. So this is part two. In part one, we introduced ourselves to the devil and Satan. And this episode is, is getting to know them a bit better and looking at a more comprehensive look at the verses that appear in the Bible about the devil and Satan. A bit of a recap first. In our first episode, we, we made two kind of foundational points. We noted that we have to be a little bit careful about how we approach these concepts, particularly if we come with a particular worldview and the worldviews that we considered were dualism, the sort of idea that there are equal and opposite forces of good and evil battling each other out there, versus the worldview that we described as monotheism. We saw that really the Bible is emphatically in the, the monotheistic worldview. The other point that we looked at was around comparative studies, which is a very interesting area of study that looks at the texts of the Bible and compares them with similar ancient texts and uh, and tries to use those to help us understand the biblical texts and often they are a help but sometimes we might be led to conclusions using those comparative texts which actually cut across the way that Jesus uses the concepts in the New Testament Jesus and the other New Testament writers and so we just made the point that where Jesus and the New Testament writers take a particular approach to an idea then that within the canon of of scripture that we're using is something that we should put appropriate weight and an authority on so so those are a couple of starting foundational points that we looked at and and then we started to delve as we often do when we're looking at a biblical concept we looked at some of the hebrew and greek words that are involved so dan as we consider and continue our thoughts about this what did we find when we we looked at the hebrew and greek words for devil and satan yeah, thank, thanks, Paul. So we looked at those words and, and found that they weren't names or they weren't just names, which often it, it sounds like they are or titles or something, hmm. but actually they're words with meaning. So the devil is something that only comes in the New Testament. It's diabolos, the word, and it, it means a false accuser or a deceiver. So we'll, we'll look at some more examples, hopefully, in this episode. And then Satan hmm. is, is an Old Testament word, is a Hebrew word, that does show up again in the New Testament. It's just been transliterated into the New Testament Greek and then therefore into the English as well. And that means an adversary or an, an opponent, you know, someone who's opposing someone. Mm. So then we looked at some examples of where they were used in, in these normal ways. Okay, so we shouldn't necessarily use them with capital letters as, as though they're proper names. And we looked at some examples of them being used as, as normal words. But I suppose that then raised the question, should they always be treated as those normal words with those meanings of deceiver, mm. false accuser, or or an adversary? So what, what did we decide on that? So then at, at that point, I think we looked at some interesting passages, some parallel passages where we have the devil or, or Satan used sort of interchangeably with other things and other concepts. And so, so, for example, there's that incident in Acts 5 where Ananias uh, it talks about him thinking up this, this evil deed in his heart. And then the next verse, Satan has conceived this thing in your heart, that kind of mm. thing. And so it, it, we concluded that there's some kind of personification of the sin or the temptation in his heart that is personified as, as this character, this Satan. So it's spoken about as if it's a person to make some really important points about this is a really big problem. So I suppose to answer that question, yeah, I mean, these are normal words, but it does seem like there is some kind of personification that's happening in some of these passages. Okay. And that's probably about as far as we got in, in our first episode, I think. We got to that preliminary conclusion, if you like, that they're words with normal meanings, but they are used as a figure of speech, if you like, as a personification of what goes on in human nature and it's tempted to to rebel against God and, and a way of representing that in a very powerful way. So, okay, it's a preliminary conclusion, but there are lots of gaps yeah. in that analysis and loads more verses that we could That's right. look at and loads more verses that you listening to this will be aware of and will be thinking of. So the purpose of this episode is to do a bit of a broader survey of those different verses where devil and Satan appear. And I'm hoping we can get to some of the related 
concepts that appear in the Bible. I'm particularly interested to talk about dragons. Okay. I'm really hoping that we can get to that. But uh, let's see how we go. Yeah. So how, how do we go about getting a broader perspective and kind of working with that preliminary conclusion, but getting a broader perspective of mm. how those words are used across Scripture. Yeah, okay. It, it's not just dragons, though, is it? There's, there's a, quite a few different animals, beasts, <laughs> and symbols that we're we're going to come yep. across. I think so. Maybe just look out for those. So how do how do we do this then? We're, we're definitely not going to be able to look at every single reference. There aren't that many. If you think about the mm. devil, I think we've already said this in the last episode. The, the word it appears thirty-seven times in the New Testament. And then the word Satan is 27 times in the Old Testament and 36 times in the New. So we could just, just one by one, go through them all, couldn't we? Which would be a bit tedious. But maybe what we could do is is group them together into categories. So that's probably the best thing to do. Yeah, and in, in some of the passages, you'll get the word appearing multiple times in a short space. Okay, so we think we can group them together into into a few categories. How many categories do you think we're okay. looking at and working with and, and how do we start to do that? So so this might be a bit arbitrary, but I think there's probably three broad categories that we can work with and we'll see where we go. And then possibly the bit about dragons at the end. So first of all then, one that's just probably very familiar with, with people when they're thinking about the concept of the devil, there's a connection there with temptation, isn't there? Very much so in, okay. in many people's minds. So the first category is, is when the devil or the Satan is used in the context of people being tempted. So there's a really obvious passage, which is Matthew chapter 4, and then the parallel passages, in, particularly in mm. Luke, when Jesus is tempted in the wilderness. And it describes a, an entity, it describes the devil or, or the Satan tempting Jesus. So there's a really obvious one there, which we have talked about in a in previous podcasts. So we'll just part that aside in a second. But then related in this sort of category, we've also got passages such as in 1 Timothy chapter 3. So this is one of the letters that okay. Paul wrote to Timothy late in life, talking about how to run a church, that kind of thing. And there's an interesting sort of sweep of verses there. It's talking about verse 1 about the office of an overseer or a bishop, so some sort of elder in the church. And in verse 6, it says, He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Okay, and verse 7, Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. So that's connected with temptation as, presumably, the the risk of succumbing to temptation. It's how you're connecting it to this in this category. Yeah, that's right. So it's describing him or this this person, this candidate for an office of, mm. of the overseer, there's different circumstances there where they might they might sin. They might fall into some sort of situation where they have sinned. They might become proud. And it's describing all these different circumstances, but then it depicts it as something to do with condemnation of the devil, snare of the devil, and so on. But what's interesting, I think, just a few verses on, in the very same sort of section... We then get qualifications for a deacon, some kind of serving person in, in the church. And verse 11, their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. It's that word slanderers, which is that very same word as devil. So all so in a short space of time, a short few verses together, you've got all these different things about how you live your life morally and choose to be be well thought of to outsiders because you're you're portraying Christ to the world and, you know, be dignified, live your life like, like these wives, sober-minded, faithful in all things, so trustworthy, and not a devil, not a slanderer, not a false accuser. You know, it feels like this, it, it fits with the, the conclusion, the tentative conclusion we, we reached, that this is some kind of personification of the uh, someone who is giving in to sin and temptation. Yeah. Let's just, shall we look at one other? So Ephesians chapter 4 is another one. So okay. Ephesians 4 and verse 26 says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. So this is, this is really interesting. Yeah. This is saying don't go to bed angry, effectively, because mm -hmm. when you're angry, you can sin. Again, this is describing some sinful behavior that can come out of the emotion of anger from within. So when you're angry and you're upset with someone, you can easily lash out or you can hurl abuse and that kind of thing. Mm. So the, the advice is, well, just sort it all out and, and make sure you don't 
seethe on it. Otherwise, it's an opportunity to the devil. And, you know, it's explaining what that means, which is, oh, when you're angry, you can easily fall into some kind of sinful behavior. Yeah. And, and it's interesting that in, in those examples you've given so far, the problem, if you like, starts with something that we can all recognize as very human, whether it's in 1 Timothy 3 about the overseer who becomes puffed up and proud and conceited or whether it's someone who's angry you know this is not a picture of some being external mm. who starts the process by introducing a temptation this starts with a completely normal understandable human yeah kind of emotion or characteristic that's absolutely right and i suppose with that in mind there are other passages in this category but, but just thinking back to matthew 4 jesus t being tempted in the wilderness mm. there is this mm. conversation with something that's called the devil and, and the satan and in the earlier podcast we've talked through that and talked through how that this actually is understood mm. by by most people in commentaries and so on to be some kind of visionary experience or some kind of parable because of various features in the yeah. narrative which then starts to make more sense when you put it alongside these verses yeah. as well Okay, just one other in this category really quickly. There's that famous passage towards the end of Ephesians chapter 6, where you have the whole armour of God being referenced. Paul says there, Ephesians 6 verse 12, or verse 11, put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Okay, I've got to put some armour on to stand against mm. the schemes of the devil. And the next verse, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. And there's probably different ways of understanding that. But probably the easiest understanding is, well, we're not fighting a literal battle here. That's what he's saying. You know, this isn't a sure. literal armor. Because okay. then he goes on to talk about the whole armor. And it's things like the breastplate of righteousness or the belt of truth and the shield of faith. These are attributes, aren't they? We're not talking literal fight in flesh and blood. We're not talking literal battle. He's absolutely saying here, I'm talking in metaphor, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, authorities, powers of the present darkness, and, and so on, which we'll, we'll perhaps mm -hmm. think about in a bit. But but yeah, there's a lot of this metaphorical so, language. Yeah. So in that, there's almost a double personification in that you have this spiritual warrior with mm. the armor of faith and righteousness and so on. And you have the devil, a personification of what anyone as a spiritual warrior needs to be aware of and, and resist. Right. So it's a very metaphorical way of representing that, mm. that contest. Yeah. Okay. So we've thought there about a range of verses that are all to do with this first category of people being tempted and falling into temptation and that being described as, for example, falling into the snare of, of the mm. devil. So it's in, entirely consistent with this personification of human sin and that influence as we've seen so far. There's other verses I'm thinking of that talk about people as being children of of the devil jesus refers to to some people in his day when he's he's debating with them he says mm. you are of, of your father the devil that people are children of the devil is that a related idea i think it probably is we're talking about john he was one of the sons of thunder wasn't he so it's a way of saying oh you're like this you know son of thunder james and john so so it's a phrase that is describing the character of someone rather than a physical relationship. Well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if you take the devil as to what it means, that false accuser or slanderer, so, you know, the sons of the slanderer, that's what you're like. They're full of, mm. they're prone to falsely accusing. They're making a habit of opposing God, that that sort of thing. I, th I think that absolutely is, is linked to this. People who have fallen into temptation and they make a habit of it, they're effectively children of the devil. You get specific passages, which are probably broadly in this category as well, about Judas, of course, the one who betrayed Jesus. Yep. There's a few here, again in John, actually. So John 6, Jesus says, one of you is a devil. And he talks, says he's referring there to Judas. John 13, it talks about the devil had already put in his heart to go and betray Jesus. And then later on in that chapter, it talks about Satan entered into him. And then off he went out in the night to go and betray Jesus. And just, I think, notice the metaphor and how fluid it is. And that's, again, a real indication that we're, we're talking in metaphor. 
it, it talks about Judas being a devil. It talks about the devil putting something in his heart and Satan entering him. You know, all these different mm. ways, very different ways. And if you're trying to literally understand what's going on, they're really quite hard to, to put together in some kind of sequence. But it seems the most consistent way of reading that is to, to fit it alongside the conclusion that we'd already reached, that this is the metaphorical language of, of people who have fallen into sinful ways. Okay, so we've looked at quite a few verses there in under this category to do with people being tempted and when they pursue that temptation to its conclusion, they're falling into the snare of the devil. If it's a habitual thing, they might be described as children of the devil. But that's all seems consistent with the conclusion that we've we've reached already. So what's the second category that we might consider here? Okay, so there's another set of references that talk about the devil or Satan in the context of illnesses that people suffer. So they're seen as a cause of illnesses or an, and a cause of, of death, effectively. So there's a couple of examples here. So so in Acts 10, it talks about Jesus who went around healing all oppressed by the devil. Okay, so there's the idea of healing people who are oppressed right. by the devil. And do you, do you remember that in Luke, one of the uh, the miracles that Jesus did? Ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? So he's talking there about this, this woman who was bent over, could not fully straighten herself, and describes it yeah. as being bound by Satan for 18 years. Again in Luke, actually, Luke chapter 10, probably quite a famous passage, actually, Luke 10 verse 18. This is after Jesus has sent out some of his disciples to go and preach the kingdom of, of God and and do various miracles to, to support the preaching. And they come back and they're really happy with what they've done. And verse 18, he says to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Okay, so... Satan falling from heaven, that's something okay. we need to think about. Yeah. You know, what does that mean? That's kind of hard to understand. Yep, yeah, it is. But why is this anything to do with illnesses? Well, actually, the context of what he's said, the whole chapter is verse 1, the Lord appointed 72 others, sent them on ahead, two by two, gave examples of what to do, don't carry a money bag, verse 5, whatever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house, and so on. Verse Eight, whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you, heal the sick in it, and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. He's commanded them to go and heal the sick. And they return, verse 17, and say, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Now, we need to sort of put a pin in that, don't okay. we? The demons. Yeah. That's that's going to be something that hopefully we talk about in the next episode. Yeah, it's a different word. In the Greek. That's and, right. And it's worthy of its own episode. That's um, right. So we need to hold that thought there. But the context there is the healing that the people have done, that the disciples have done. Yeah. And and when people are healed, it's like Satan falling like lightning from heaven. That's the connection there. So it's a different kind of concept going on here. with Because you can see if, if this woman, for example, Satan is bound for 18 years, yeah. if she's healed, then Satan has no more, has, has right. lost his power. Yeah, that's right. Or lost its power over over whatever whatever yeah, it yeah. is. It kind of fits with falling from heaven in that in that sense. But it's a different concept from sin. That, yes. That we've associated with devil and Satan up to now. So how how are these connected? Yeah, so it's not a direct correspondence, is it here? It's not like there was some specific sin mm. that has then suddenly meant that this woman has, has now been suffer, suffering this condition and so on. But but sin and mortality and our sort of frail human nature, as it were, intrinsically connected, aren't they? You know, we've seen that sin has the power over death. That was what we talked about in the last episode, haven't we? So that yeah. passage in, in yeah. well, the comparison between Hebrews chapter 2 and then passages in Romans and James where it talks about what Jesus has done in destroying the devil, the one that has the power over death. Okay, so sin has in its kind of full outworking has physical consequences. Sure. Ultimately death. Yeah. And are we wrapping illnesses and diseases in with that? Yeah. Okay, so so there's our second category of these re references to devil and Satan in association with people being afflicted with diseases and the whole condition that ultimately is to do with our mortality. Mm. And there's a connection with sin there because that's that has the power of death ultimately and mortality. So when those things, those illnesses and 
and sicknesses are cured in the way that Jesus and, and his disciples cured them, that is overcoming that power, the, the power of mortality and death that sin has over human beings as a result of temptation and sin. Okay, so so that's our second category. What about the third category? I think you said there will be three main categories yeah, before that's... we talk about dragons. <laughs> okay, so the third one is the words devil and Satan seem to show up when the context is about powers that oppose or afflict God or, or God's people. And this is more than just a human being who's fallen into temptation, an individual, or one person, but sort of political systems or religious systems that have actually people in authority, governments that now have power. So there's a few examples of this in, in Revelation, actually. So let's just look at one of those. So Revelation chapter 2 yeah. and verse 9, this is the one of those those seven letters at the start of the book of Revelation. And if you're scratching your head thinking, I'd love to have a six-part series of podcasts on the book of Revelation, then just look back in our archives to find exactly what you're looking for. So in this section of seven letters, there's this letter to the angel of the church in Smyrna. And verse nine says, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich and the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Uh, do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and for 10 days you will have tribulation. So these are real letters, effectively, or, or sections of this letter that are directed at to these real churches. And what's going on here is seemingly the persecution of Christians, persecution of the Christian church in, in Smyrna. And it's described as the synagogue of Satan. This is probably in this particular instance, a Jewish religious opposition to Christians. And then, you know, this is quickly followed in history by Roman persecution, Roman authorities persecuting Christians. And so that's that's a big feature of, and background of the book of Revelation, isn't it? There's something really sinister, isn't there, about humans who are capable of falling into temptation and sin. That You know, when they're angry and they don't get rid of their anger when they go to bed, they're quite capable of <laughs> stewing over it and coming yeah. up with more sinful actions. But when you get a, a whole load of those humans working together in some kind of organization or some kind of political system, they can cause more harm than, than they each could individually put together. Mm. It's pretty pretty sinister, pretty awful. So just as you know, an individual could start to behave in a way that is sinful and, and give in to that temptation, if you like, but when that becomes a collective mm. expression of that, whether it's anger or pride or something when it becomes collectively expressed in power structures and mm. like political or religious. Yeah, I can see that that amplifies the, uh, yeah, the effect. That's right. I mean, and just, just flicking down through that passage, the letter to the church in Pergamum talks about, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. So Satan's throne is in Pergamum. Well, that seems strange if you see Satan as this one individual, this spiritual being. But it's quite clear, isn't it, I think, in the context that in these references, it's definitely talking about the ruling powers that are opposing God and God's people. There's another example in Peter's letter. Let's just have a look at this one. Okay, so um, it's not just a, a book of Revelation thing. No, no, that's right. But now we've seen that, we might be able to see it in these other references as well. So 1 Peter 5 and verse 8, we read that Peter says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. So, with the thoughts from Revelation in mind, thinking about the mm. suffering that the brotherhood is experiencing around the world, at the hands of people from the synagogue of Satan, the ruling authorities and so on, yeah. this, this makes perfect sense again. The devil will likely want to throw many of them in prison, would like to throw many of them to the lions and the, and that sort of thing happened. Yeah, and we have another another animal introduced. Yes, we have the lion 
And certainly any reading of the letters and the Acts of the Apostles, we know exactly the kind of things that were, were happening to them, being imprisoned mm. and killed in some cases. That's right. That Ephesians 6 reference that we looked at about the whole armour of God, where it yeah. says we're not, not fighting against flesh and blood, but against these rulers and principalities and so on. This is probably where sin was also manifest. That's possibly what, what that's referring to as well. Okay. So we've covered those three main categories, kind of starting with the one that was closest to the conclusion that we talked about in the first episode, that devil and Satan are these terms that are often a personification of sin in human behavior to do with people being tempted. But then there's these two kind of related categories that sort of grow out of that one, I suppose, in that sinful mm. behavior is ultimately the root cause of mortality and death and the illnesses and and diseases and, and so on that human beings suffer, that when those things are healed, that can be seen as solving the problem of sin personified in the devil or starting to solve the problem. And then we've seen that sinful actions, desires can be expressed through political and religious power structures. And that's when it gets, as you say, mm -hmm. quite scary and amplified. So it's both related to the first concept. And we've looked at quite a few passages now. I haven't kept a count, but I don't know, we're probably up to 20 or so in total across those, those categories. And we're able to see them all consistent with that preliminary conclusion of devil and Satan mm. not being a personal being, but a personification of this sin influence. And actually, when you think about those other two categories of illness and of political expressions of sin, it really emphasizes and makes a powerful point about the far-reaching implications of sin and human choices to rebel against against God. So, okay, having got that far, can we can we talk about dragons? We can if you'd like to. And I, I guess you've got a passage <laughs> in mind, haven't you? Which is... Of course I have, yes. Yep, it's Revelation is, chapter 12. Yeah, go ahead. Pick okay, out your favourite so verses about dragons, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> so it's Revelation 12 and, and verse 1. A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and a head a crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven diadems. And then just a little bit later, down in verse 7, we read about war in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth. It's dramatic stuff. It certainly is. It does. It sounds <laughs> like, you know, you've got war in heaven. Yeah. You've got these opposing forces of That's good right. and evil. Yeah. How, how do we get our heads around that in the context of everything else we've said? Yeah. Well, in just a few minutes at the close of this episode, we're not <laughs> going to be able to just talk through Revelation in detail, but again, refer back to that series that we've gone through. Maybe this will whet your appetite a little bit. One of the big things that we observe when we're reading Revelation is that this is a highly symbolic book. Even in those letters that we saw, there are symbols used, aren't there? Mm. The vision section is kind of talking about the same sort of thing. It's talking about the persecution and the experiences of people in the Roman Empire in a different way. So first thing, uh, I probably said a few things in one go, but <laughs> first thing is, this is, a, this is a symbol. I mean, it, it says that, doesn't it? This is a sign in heaven. That's mm. clearly saying this is not a literal thing happening in heaven or that happened in heaven. You know, there's seven heads, there's ten horns. This is not a beast that is real. And you, you've got to just look back at things like the book of Daniel in the Old Testament to see where this style of imagery comes from. They're not describing things sort of literally. So, so the dragon is a symbol. So, sorry, Paul, this is this is a symbol of something. <laughs> we're not going to train this dragon. No, no, we're not. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, when this dragon enters, it tells us what it's about. It's this ancient serpent, this devil and Satan. It tells us what it's referring to, which then, of course, that takes us right back to the, the Old Testament, doesn't it? It's referring mm. to the serpent, Genesis chapter 3, and temptation, temptation in the garden, which is it's the same thing that we've been talking about, isn't it? You know, that it's the experience of temptation leading to sin, 
So it's sin personified. In this vision, you know, it's like a serpent on steroids almost, isn't it? <laughs> it's, 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 it's making <laughs> yeah. this really, really big and amplified. This, this is a system of, of sin or, or I suppose almost that third category that we looked at, this terrible mm. political or religious, however you sort of fully un- yeah, understand it, but-, but a human government system that exemplifies the worst of sin and the worst of temptation. I think that's probably what's going on. So yeah, a, a dragon, probably a, a biblical dragon is is pretty much like a flying serpent, isn't it? So there we go. Yeah. And so if we're linking it with Genesis and the temptation and the cause of sin and human rebellion against god and actually as we read on in revelation chapter 12 the dragon is thrown down there's a bit of an explanation as to why how that happened and it's as a result of of the sacrifice of jesus you know they conquered him by the blood of the lamb Mm. so it's actually quite similar to hebrews 2 verse 14 that we looked at where jesus has overcome that which has the power of death that is the devil. It's the same, same yeah. concept. Yeah, that's right. And, and again, that's a verse that explains this, isn't it? Yeah, so you've got all this strange mm. imagery and this dragon's thrown down and, well, here we go. This is what it's all about. Well, they conquered him by the blood of the lamb. You know, that's that's telling us what this is about. So, yeah, it's about the death yeah. of Jesus destroying the, the power of, of sin, the power of death. It links us back again to that Luke reference, do you remember, about Satan falling from from heaven again it's reminiscent a little uh, bit yeah. of that yeah you know this figurative expression of something has been overthrown something has has been overcome victory has been gained something's fallen from heaven yeah. it's no longer in power it's no longer ruling and this is why when you know if you ask the question well when has the personal being satan the agent of evil when has it literally fallen from heaven you're driven to that conclusion of, of working out well when's this happened and some people put it before genesis some people put before it you know at different points and mm-hmm. you, you basically you, yeah, it throws up yeah. lots of you interpretive can't, problems can't answer that question. yeah you can't yeah, yeah that's right and the reason being because all these different instances of satan falling from heaven in inverted commas are are figurative expressions of the power of sin and death mm. being overcome in in different ways but mm. ultimately it's when jesus gave himself that's what it is really when yeah. the, the ultimate okay. victory was won. Okay, but that explanation of the symbol there in Revelation 12, the, the ancient serpent, devil and Satan, that took us right back to Genesis yeah. 3. Is is that the only Old Testament reference point for this kind of creature? It's probably a convergence of, of so many Old Testament references that come together in this symbol, and like much of the book of Revelation does, that, you know, lots of mm. lots of passages are woven together. I mean, the, I've just been talking about the whole idea of casting down from heaven, and you, you, get, you get that in, uh, in Isaiah, don't you? And I'll just turn this up. In Isaiah chapter 27, you get a creature in a few different passages, but it, it turns up here in Isaiah 27 verse 1. In that day, the Lord with his hard and great and strong sword will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, Leviathan, the twisting serpent, and he will slay the dragon that is in the sea. So it, there seems to be an echo or, or a quote or, or something there from here in the Revelation chapter 12. Mm. So it's drawing from this passage here as well. So, you know, what on earth have we got now? We've got something called <laughs> Leviathan, <laughs> okay? A fleeing serpent, right. a twisting serpent, a dragon in the sea. So we're really building a, a huge sort of collage of different different animals and beasts and mythical creatures. But so they're all pretty fierce. They are pretty da- and dangerous. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. From the scorpion <laughs> even to to this, yeah. this Leviathan. Yeah, the lion and the lion. Yeah. So, well, you know, what is Leviathan? Very briefly, <laughs> we're, we're looking at something that is really similar to some of the the Ugaritic or Canaanite chaos sea monsters. Okay, I've just said that in one okay. sentence. Okay. That's probably going to prompt, <laughs> if you've never, never come across that, that's going to prompt all sorts of questions. So, but this is, we've talked about comparative, you know, it, it's a it's a creature that is found in other ancient texts, whether it's sure. Ugaritic or Canaanite, and represents chaos. Yeah, that's right. So that- so the comparative study is really helpful because we can we can look see that comparison, but then we can see how the Bible uses it. And we've gone through all these passages in the New Testament, in Revelation and so on, and see how this is all, these imagery, these, this metaphor and the, this, this symbol, this mythical beast is partly used here 
to describe this terrible sin, this condition of sin, mm. this awful human wickedness. You know, the, the real the enemy isn't some mythical beast. The, the enemy isn't some spiritual devil out there. It's redefining it and showing that it's somewhere else. So this symbol of Leviathan comes up and it's applied to the evil human governments of you know Pharaoh and Egypt and and so on. And then and then you get it in Job, don't you? Just to sort of finally finish off. Yeah. Job, right at the end of Job, this this long description of, of Leviathan. It has smoke coming out of its nostrils. That's or right. Fire yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah, and scales as well. And yeah. you know, this yeah. is a this is a swimming dragon, sea dragon, for sure. <laughs> and and the, the whole point of that chapter is God saying to Job, Well, can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook? Can you put a rope in his nose, pierce its jaw with a hook? Can you can you can you train this dragon? Can you tame <laughs> tame this beast? And yeah. uh, you know, at the end, it's, he says, God says, he sees everything that is high. He is king over all the sons of pride, and that's the culminating passage. And I, I think when we've seen everything we've seen, this is clearly a depiction, a metaphor for the proud heart of, of a human, effectively. And mm. then, what's Job's response to this? Well, he says, Job answers the Lord and says, "I know you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted." I've uttered things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. You know, he's brought to this kind of realization. Humility. Yeah, and the humility. Opposite of pride. That's right. Yeah. 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 So, so what have, what have we seen? We've seen a lion. We've seen a serpent, scorpion. We, we found your dragon, Paul. And now some yeah. mythical sea monster. And this real eclectic mix of, of terrifying, fierce beasts. And wonderful to, to think about, but terrifying metaphors for, for evil that, that comes from human hearts. Mm. That's our enemy. That's what the giving of Jesus' his life, that's what he overcame, and that's what he can help us overcome. And I think it was the last episode we did, Why Did Jesus Have to Die yeah. with John Launchbury? You know, thinking about what the death of Jesus meant and what it's all about. It's about bringing humans, bringing us to this realization that we need to change. God doesn't need to change. We do. We've got to change our behavior. Mm. We've got to crucify the, the flesh with its lusts and desires and things like that. We've got to do it. And this destroying of the devil, the one that has the power of the death by the blood of Jesus. Yeah. And I, I was just going to reflect on that thread that perhaps we've seen right from opening chapters of Genesis, the serpent that kind of appears as this leviathan the twisting serpent dragon in the sea and then finds its way all the way through into the new testament but used in a similar way as symbolic as a metaphor for the full extent of of how sin can express itself through not just individual humans but through you know a society of human beings that are, are, are kind of all subject to the same mm. temptation and you know largely giving into it, following it, and the, and the consequences of that. We've also just there touched on the book of Job. We've gone <laughs> to all the, all the, the difficult, difficult places, Revelation, Job. And there is obviously a really well-known passage in Job that talks about Satan appearing yeah. and having conversations with God. And, and just so that you don't think we're ignoring that, we, we will aim to cover some of the aspects, at least, of that, that passage in another episode around the sons of God and what that means when they come together. So there, I think we probably have covered enough for one episode. And hopefully through breaking all those occurrences down and grouping them into categories, we've seen how, although the words are used in different ways, we can see the link between the fundamental concept and conclusion that we drew in the first episode. And we've also pointed you to several other podcasts as well, the series on Matthew, where there's a specific episode just about the, the temptations of Jesus in the wilderness and the role of the devil in that, and the series on Revelation, as well as John Launchbury's conversation that we had with him about why did Jesus have to die just recently. So thanks for listening to this, and congratulations if you've listened to this all in one go and made it through to the end. And we will be back soon, God willing, for uh, another session on a topic related to this. You've been listening to the Bible Feed podcast. Thanks for joining us. We're always keen to hear what you think, hear your questions or subjects you'd like us to discuss. Get in touch with us on our Facebook page or send a message from our webpage at biblefeed.org and be part of the journey.